Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning I am Dr Kalpana Ramachandran Professor and Head Department of Anatomy Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research Institute Chennai Tamil Nadu In today's session we will be discussing about the development of face and palate First let us look at the objectives of this class At the end of this lecture you should be able to describe the development of face describe the developmental basis of congenital anomalies of face describe the development of palate and also describe the developmental basis of congenital anomalies of palate let me introduce this class by a case study a 10 days old newborn baby is brought to the opd by its mother with a complaint of inability to feed and has nasal regurgitation of fluids whenever it is fed with milk the mother gave a history that the baby was delivered normally and was a full term infant the questions for discussion will be what is the clinical condition explain the embryological basis of this clinical presentation this will be discussed at the end of the lecture first we look at the development of face in this picture you can see that the ventral aspect of the embryo has got two bulgings one is the bulging brain and another one is a bulging pericardium separated by the stomatodium which is the future mouth the neck is formed between the stomatodium and the pericardium by the development of mesodermal bars which are called as pharyngeal arches in the lateral and ventral walls of the foregut this is quite relevant to the development of the face so after the formation of the head fold of the embryo the developing brain and the pericardium form two prominent bulgings in the ventral aspect of the embryo so these are separated by the stomatodium which is the future mouth you can see from this picture that the floor of the stomatodium is formed by the buccopharyngeal membrane this is the buccopharyngeal membrane and when this breaks down the foregut will be open to the exterior so look at this picture you can see a process here which is called frontonasal process so what is it the mesenchyme which is covering the developing forebrain along with the ectoderm is going to form a projection downward projection which is going to overlap the upper part of the stomatodium this process is called as frontonasal process this downward projection is called as frontonasal process so during the fourth and fifth weeks of development of the embryo the embryo is characterized by the presence of what is called as pharyngeal arches or branchial arches it is marked in this picture this is seen in the neck region so these pharyngeal arches are laid down in the lateral and ventral walls of the most cranial part of the foregut so what is shown here is the pharyngeal gut so in the lateral and ventral walls you can see that the pharyngeal arches are laid down so they are nothing but thickenings in the wall of the foregut they are the mesodermal bars so initially there are six arches but the fifth arch will disappear so you look at this picture this is a section through the embryo going through the pharyngeal arches so if you make a section you can see that the pharyngeal arches 
has got a outer ectoderm this is the ectoderm and inner endoderm which is the endoderm of the foregut and these are the pharyngeal arches which are the mesodermal bars so they have a central core of mesenchyme what you are seeing here is a core of mesenchyme outside is ectoderm inside is endoderm and this is the central core of mesenchyme with nerve artery and cartilage i told you there are six pharyngeal arches the first uh, in that fifth arch disappears the first pharyngeal arch is called as mandibular arch you can see in this picture this is the developing phase this is the first pharyngeal arch which is quite associated with the development of face having known this we will move to the development of face so if you look at this picture this is the stomatodium which is the future mouth this is bounded on the cephalic side by a process which i have already described that is the fronto nasal process cardally it is bounded by the first arch which is the mandibular arch so this mandibular arch is going to divide into two process maxillary and mandibular process so a mandibular process is going to develop on each side of the first pharyngeal arch and it lies cordal to the stomodium you can see that it is lying cordal to the stomodium the maxillary process is going to develop on each side from the cephalic aspect of the dorsal part of first pharyngeal arch so this picture shows stomatodium this is the fronto nasal process and this is the maxillary and mandibular process and this one is the bulging pericardial cavity having oriented to this we will just look at the further development of face so the maxillary process is going to lie lateral to the stomodium so this maxillary process lies lateral to the stomodium the development of face hence is going to center around the stomodium and is contributed by five processes namely fronto nasal process two maxillary process and two mandibular process so the mesenchyme of these processes is going to be contributed by the migrating neural crest cells we will further go into the development of face having learnt the five processes at this stage there are going to be thickenings in the ectoderm which are called as placodes ectodermal thickenings are called as placodes are developed which also contribute to the development of face first is the nasal placode nasal placode which is formed on either side of the midline just above the stomatodium you can see in the lower picture above the stomatodium in the fronto nasal process on either side of the midline you have the nasal placode formed just cranial and lateral to it another placode is formed which is called as lens placode i will refer to this once we do a part of the development of eye along with the development of face and palate so now at this stage there are two placodes one is the nasal placode another one is the lens placode so next what happens is the nasal placode sinks below the surface to form what is called as nasal pit what i am pointing out now is the nasal pit once there is a depression the sides are elevated hence you have a medial raised edge which is called as medial nasal process and a lateral raised edge which is called as lateral nasal process at this stage there is the formation of nasal pit and a medial nasal process and lateral nasal process i will just summarize what we have learned till now 
the five processes which are formed in and around the stomatodium that is the future mouth one frontonasal process then you have two maxillary process and two mandibular process next is the formation of ectodermal thickening above the stomatodium on either sides of the midline that is called as nasal placoid cranial and lateral to it is a formation of lens placoid the nasal placoid is going to sink below the surface and forms the nasal pit what i am pointing out is a nasal pit and medially you have a raised edge which is called as medial nasal process and laterally you have the lateral nasal process having learnt about the various processes and the two placoids we will further proceed into the development of face we will first look at the development of upper lip so at this stage what happens is the maxillary process this is the maxillary process which grows medially and it is first going to fuse with the lateral nasal process and then it fuses with the medial nasal process next what happens is both the me medial and lateral nasal process fuses and cuts off the nasal pit from the stomatodium so the nasal pits now they are going to be called as external nares or cut off from the stomatodium that is the future mouth next is the maxillary process is going to undergo considerable growth and hence the fronto nasal process becomes very narrow from side to side because of this what happens is the two external nares come closer to each other and also the two medial nasal process merge with each other or fuse with each other and they contribute to the formation of this part of the upper lip which is called philtrum of the upper lip so the philtrum of the upper lip is formed by the fusion of fusion of the two medial nasal process the lateral portion of the upper lip is going to be contributed by the maxillary process so the philtrum of the upper lip is going to be formed by the fused medial nasal process the lateral portion what is marked as red is going to be formed by the maxillary process at this stage it is very important to note that the lateral nasal process do not contribute to the formation of upper lip only the medial nasal process the fused medial nasal process forms the philtrum lateral portion is formed by the maxillary process lateral nasal process do not contribute to the formation of upper lip then what happens is the surface cells from the maxillary process overgrow the medial nasal process forming the epithelium of the philtrum coming to the development of lower lip the mandibular process of the two sides grow towards each other fuse in the midline so the fused mandibular process gives rise to the lower lip and also to the lower jaw so we have looked at the development of upper lip and the lower lip coming to the development of muscles of the face the muscles of the face are derived from the mesoderm of second pharyngeal arch this mesoderm is nothing but paraxial mesoderm that is derived from the somatomeres since the muscles of the face are derived from the second pharyngeal arch the nerve of the second arch pharyngeal arch is facial nerve and hence the muscles derive their motor supply from the facial nerve 
Coming to the development of the external nose, nose is formed by five processes. The frontonasal process gives rise to the bridge of the nose. The frontonasal process gives rise to the bridge of the nose. The merged medial nasal process gives rise to the crest and tip of the nose. The lateral nasal process is going to give rise to the ala of the nose. These are the ala of the nose which are coming from the lateral nasal process. The crest and tip are going to be coming from the merged medial nasal process and the bridge is going to come from the frontonasal process and hence these five processes are going to contribute to the formation of external nose. Next is the development of cheeks. The lateral angles of the oral fissure, these are the lateral angles of the oral fissure are formed at the junction of maxillary process and the mandibular process. Maxillary process is in red in this picture and mandibular process is in light green in this picture. So, the lateral angles of the oral fissure, this is the oral fissure, is formed at the junction of maxillary and mandibular process. Initially, the lateral angles you can see in this picture are widely separated. It is very, very wide. Next, what happens is there is fusion of maxillary process with the mandibular process. Hence, the lateral angle shifts more medially and this also results in the formation of the cheek. Compare this picture on the left with this picture on the right. Because of the fusion of maxillary process and mandibular process, the lateral angle is going to shift more medially. That is the formation of the cheek and also shifting of the lateral angles of the mouth. Next is the development of nasolacrimal duct. The maxillary process as I have already told you fuses with the lateral nasal process. You orient yourself to this picture. This is the medial nasal process, lateral nasal process. This is the maxillary process and this is the mandibular process. This is nasal pit and this is the stomatodium. So, the maxillary process fuses with the lateral nasal process. So, this fusion is going to extend from the stomatodium to the medial angle of the eye. Already I have talked about the lens placard. This is the area where your eye is developing. So, this fusion between the maxillary and lateral nasal process is going to extend from the stomatodium, from the stomatodium to the medial angle of the eye. So, you can see that the line of fusion is initially marked by a groove what is shown here in pink. That groove is called as nasooptic furrow. It is called as nasooptic furrow or the nasolacrimal groove. So, this nasolacrimal groove you can see from this picture is going to lie between the maxillary process and lateral nasal process. What happens is the ectoderm in the floor of this groove invaginates and into the underlying mesenchyme and forms a cord like precursor for a duct which is called as nasolacrimal duct. So, the ectoderm in the floor of this groove invaginates into the underlying mesenchyme and forms a cord like nasolacrimal duct. So, once this duct is formed, it gets canalized and it forms the nasolacrimal duct. Its upper end widens and forms the lacrimal sac close to the medial angle of the eye. You can see from this picture, uh, this is in adults, the lower picture is in adults. This is the medial angle of the eye. You can see the lacrimal sac. So, this formation of the nasolacrimal duct uh, this is invested by bone during ossification of the maxilla. So, compare the position of the nasolacrimal duct during development. 
and in the adults. So, you can see that the nasolacrimal duct extends from the medial angle of the eye to the stomatodium and this nasal pit later on separates from the stomatodium okay and hence this nasolacrimal duct will open into the nasal cavity. This is in case of adults the nasolacrimal duct will open into the inferior meatus in the lateral wall of the nose. So, hence you can compare the development with its adult position that is the development of nasolacrimal duct. Coming to the development of eye, the region of the eye is initially seen as a lens placode. I told lens placode lies cranial and lateral to the nasal placode. What happens is the lens placode sinks below the surface and is eventually cut off from the ectoderm. So, the developing eyeball will produce a bulging in this situation. So, the bulging eyes are initially directed laterally. They are going to lie in the angle between the maxillary process and also the lateral nasal process. So, this is the angle what I am pointing out that is the angle between the lateral nasal process and the maxillary process. So, initially the developing eyes are directed laterally. Then there is going to be narrowing of the frontonasal process because of the development or growth of the maxillary process. Because of this what happens is that eyes which were directed laterally comes to face forwards. The eyelids what you are seeing here are derived from folds of ectoderm. They lie above and below the eye and below the ectoderm you have the mesoderm which is enclosed within the folds. So, eyelids are derived from the folds of ectoderm that are formed above and below the eyes and by the mesoderm which are enclosed within these folds. Coming to the development of auricle, you can see in this picture that there are mesodermal thickenings which are formed. These are the mesodermal thickenings which are called as hillux, auricular hillux. Where do they appear? They are going to appear on the dorsal aspects of the first and second arch. This is the first arch, the two process of first arch you are seeing. Here is the developing second arch. So, the dorsal end, this is the dorsal end of the first and second pharyngeal arches where you are seeing the mesodermal thickenings. These are the mesodermal thickenings which are called as auricular hillux. So, these auricular hillux or the mesodermal thickenings fuse and they form the auricle. So, that is the development of auricle. So, we have till now learnt the development of face, eye and also the auricle. I will just summarize what we have learnt till now. We have learnt that the development of face centers around the stomatodium which is the future mouth and is mainly contributed by five processes namely frontonasal process, maxillary process and mandibular process. In the frontonasal process, ectodermal thickening called as nasal plaque code is going to appear cranial to the stomatodium and it is lying on either side. This nasal plaque code sinks below the surface and hence the medial and lateral raised edges are called as medial nasal process and lateral nasal process. The maxillary process on both sides are going to grow medially. It fuses first with the lateral nasal process and then it fuses with the medial nasal process. Then there is going to be fusion of medial nasal process and lateral nasal process. Because of the growth of the maxillary process medially, the frontonasal process becomes much narrower from side to side. The philtrum of the upper lip is going to be derived from the fused medial nasal process and lateral portion of the upper lip is going to be derived from the maxillary process. 
the lateral nasal process do not contribute to the formation of upper lip. The fused mandibular process is going to contribute to the formation of lower lip and also the lower jaw that completes the development of face. We will just look at some of the clinical correlates of the development of face. I will be discussing this under these headings. One is the cleft lip, it is also called as hair lip. Next is macrostomia and microstomia, oblique facial cleft, proboscis and cyclops. First, we will take up cleft lip. You have to understand that the basic morphology of the face is created between 4th and 10th weeks of development. The spectrum of anomalies known as facial clefts, it can be lip, cleft lip or cleft palate occur as a result of the facial prominences failing to fuse with each other correctly. So, we will have a classification for the cleft lip. First classification is central and lateral cleft lip. Central it is very rare, it is because of failure of fusion of two bulbous extremities of medial nasal process. Lateral cleft lip can be unilateral which is very common or it can be bilateral on both sides. This is one classification. Second classification is it can be incomplete or complete. Incomplete means does not extend into the nostril. Complete means it extends to the floor of the nose. Third classification is it can be uncomplicated or it can be complicated. Complicated means it is associated with cleft in the alveolus or a cleft in the palate. So, this is three types of classification of the cleft lip. Having understood that, we will just look at what is median cleft lip. If the two medial nasal processes fail to fuse, the child can have a median cleft lip. It is called median cleft lip. It is because of the failure of fusion of two medial nasal processes. It is very rare. This is median. Next is medial. Please note this. This is medial cleft lip. You can see in this picture, this is the region where you get the medial cleft lip. So, this is because of the failure of fusion of the medial nasal process with the maxillary process. I have already told you that maxillary process fuses with the medial nasal process and this contributes maxillary process contributes to the lateral portion of the upper lip and the fused medial nasal process contributes to the filtrum of the upper lip. If there is going to be problem with the fusion of medial nasal process and the maxillary process, there will be a medial cleft lip. Please differentiate median cleft lip from the medial cleft lip. So, this is medial cleft lip. Next is lateral cleft lip. Lateral cleft lip is called as macrostomia. We have already seen that maxillary and mandibular process will fuse and the lateral angles of the mouth will shift more medially. If they fail to fuse, the maxillary and mandibular process fails to fuse, the condition is called as macrostomia. This is wide mouth. Macrostomia is wide mouth. If there is going to be too much fusion of this maxillary and mandibular process, it results in a small mouth which is called as microstomia. Macrostomia is wide mouth and microstomia is small mouth. In macrostomia, there is failure of fusion of maxillary and mandibular process. If these two process fuse too much, it is microstomia or small mouth. 
then there is a clinical condition called as oblique facial cleft you can see in this picture that there is a cleft in the face which is oblique facial cleft this is seen along the nasolacrimal groove extending from the medial angle of the eye to the mouth already we have seen the development of nasolacrimal duct we have understood that the maxillary process and the lateral nasal process fuse and this is going to extend from the medial angle of the eye to the stomatodium which is the future mouth so along the nasolacrimal groove uh, if there is failure of fusion of this maxillary process with the lateral nasal process there is going to be this oblique facial cleft so you can see that in this picture the cleft is going to extend from the medial angle of the eye to the mouth so this is oblique facial cleft next is a clinical condition called as cyclops in some cases one half of the nose may be absent sometimes rarely the nose forms a cylindrical projection or proboscis you can see in this picture the nose forms a cylindrical projection or proboscis which is jutting out just below the forehead it is just jutting out below the forehead this anomaly may sometimes affect only one affect only one half of the nose or it is associated with fusion of two eyes you can see that there is fusion of two eyes this condition is called as cyclops and this is proboscis nothing but nose is going to form a cylindrical projection jutting out just below the forehead and sometimes it is associated with fusion of both eyes which is called as cyclops having understood the development of face and the various congenital anomalies of face will move into the development of palate so we have already seen that the medial nasal processes or the prominences merge so the two merged medial nasal prominences fuse not only at the surface level but also at a deeper level but also at a deeper level so the structure formed by the two merged prominences is called as the intermaxillary segment these are the maxillary process this is the two merged medial nasal prominences okay which is called as intermaxillary segment so if you look at the picture lower down you can see that the intermaxillary segment has got three components one is the labial component which is going to form the philtrum of the upper lip which we have seen already next component is the upper jaw component what you are seeing here is upper jaw component where you have the incisor teeth next is what i am pointing out is the palatal component palatal component so the merged medial nasal prominences merge not only at the surface level but also at a deeper level to form what is called intermaxillary segment this has got three components one is fo forming the philtrum of upper lip next is the lab, uh, upper jaw component where your incisor teeth are present and third one is a palatal component this palatal component is called as primary palate so this is also called as premaxilla this palatal component is called as premaxilla you see in this picture this is a maxillary process so there are going to be shelf like projections two shelf like projections or outgrowths from the maxillary processes or prominences which are called as palatine shelves what is given here in dark orange color is the palatine shelves they are going to come from the maxillary process from the maxillary process on either side you have two shelf like projections which are called as palatine shelves so this palatine shelves you can see that this is a picture to show the developing mouth and also the palate this is a section so the palatine shelves you can see from this picture they are going to fuse 
they are going to attain a horizontal position above the tongue. They are going to be above the tongue. These two what is marked in blue color are the palatine shelves which are going to fuse above the developing tongue. And you can see the nasal septum coming from above which is also going to fuse with the palatine shelves. So, this palatine shelves are called as the secondary palate. When they fuse, they are called as the secondary palate. So, in this picture, you can see that the palatine shelves have fused. So, this is your secondary palate. What is shown here like a triangular area is the primary palate which is derived from the fused medial nasal process at a deeper level. So, now you have a primary palate and a secondary palate. In this picture, you can see the fused palatine shelves above the tongue and you can see the nasal septum extending downwards. So, once they fuse the primary and secondary palate, they form the definitive palate. The junction between the primary and secondary palate, this junction is called as incisive fossa. Incisive fossa. Please note as the palatal shelves fuse, as I have shown in the previous picture, the nasal septum will grow down and joins the cephalic aspect of the newly formed palate. So, the primary palate and secondary palate are fusing to form the definitive palate. At this stage, when they are fusing, the palatal shells are fusing, the nasal septum is going to come and join the cephalic aspect of the newly formed palate. So, junction between primary and secondary palate is called as incisive fossa. So, this is the definitive palate which is formed. What you are seeing here is the definitive palate which is formed. Please note that the ventral three-fourth of this definitive palate is ossified and that is your hard palate. What you are seeing in an osteology bone is the hard palate that is ventral three-fourth of the definitive palate is going to become ossified and forms the hard palate. The unossified, this is the unossified dorsal one-fourth which is going to form the soft palate. Anterior three-fourth forms the ventral three-fourth of the definitive palate is hard palate and dorsal one-fourth is going to form the soft palate. This is the formation of palate, both hard and soft palate. So, we will summarize what we have learnt about the development of palate. We just talked about primary palate, secondary palate and a definitive palate. So, primary palate is nothing but the palatal component of the merged medial nasal process. Then you have the secondary palate which is nothing but the palatine shelves which are coming from the maxillary process from either side and they are fusing and forming the secondary palate. The primary palate and secondary palate are fusing. The junction is marked in adults by the incisive fossa. Then what happens is ventral three-fourth of the definitive palate is ossified and it is going to form the hard palate. The unossified dorsal one-fourth forms the soft palate. So, this completes the development of palate. We will just look at some of the congenital anomalies of the palate that is the cleft palate. You have a complete cleft palate, two halves of the palate, failure of fusion of the palatine cross of maxilla and the pre-maxilla that is complete. The entire thing fails to fuse, the primary palate, secondary palate, entire thing there is a cleft it is called as complete. Two halves the palate is in the form of two halves. This is failure of fusion of palatine process of maxilla and pre-maxilla. Incomplete is it can be a bifid uvula, uvula alone can be divided or it can affect the whole length of soft palate, the soft palate alone can be involved or it in, can involve the whole length of soft palate and posterior part of the hard palate. This is incomplete. 
complete is the entire palette is involved it is in the form of two halves. So, that completes the development of palate and its congenital anomalies. Now, we will go back to the case study. We just uh, introduced the lecture with a case study that a 10 day old newborn baby was brought to the OPD by its mother with complaints of nasal regurgitation of fluid and inability to feed. So, what is this clinical condition? The clinical condition as we have discussed is cleft palate. What is the embryological basis of this clinical presentation? We have already discussed in detail that there are three components involved in the development of palate that is the paired palatal process of maxilla which we called it as a secondary palate. The nasal septum growing from above and fusing with the palate and also the primary palate which is nothing but the fused medial nasal process. The timing of fusion and extent of fusion of these components play an important role in the development of normal palate. Because the newborn has got a cleft in the palate, it is whenever it is taking its feed, there is nasal regurgitation of fluid. So, this can be associated with cleft lip. In, uh, in this case which was presented, the baby is apparently normal and cleft lip is not associated with cleft palate. That completes the case study and its discussion.